Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start, uh, we'd kindly ask you to turn off your mobile phones. We are here today to launch the second report of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. The report is called The War on Drugs and HIV AIDS, How the Criminalization of Drug Use Fuels the Global Pandemic. We would like to just welcome all of you that could join us here today. My name is Ilona Sobo. I'm from the Secretariat of the Global Commission and will be the chair for this press conference. So joining us by phone is former president of Brazil, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, the chair of the Global Commission, and Sir Richard Branson. And with us here at the studio, we have Madame Ritreifus, former president of Switzerland, Dr. Michel Kazatsky, former director of the Global Fund to Fight HIV, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and Maria Yakpo Yak Yakovlyeva, a young Russian HIV activist. So in your press kits, you're going to find the two reports of the Global Commission. Uh, there's also the biographies from the participants here, uh, a presentation with key facts and figures, and a press release. Uh, after the presentations, the introductory remarks from all the panelists, we'll open the floor for, for questions. So we'd like just to call President Cardozo. So the floor is yours, President Cardozo. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk to you, all of you there. You know, as chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, I wish to start this conversation by saying a few words about who we are and what we have been doing. The Global Commission was created in 2010 to break the taboo about the war on drugs and to promote a debate about more human and effective policies. The Commission is made up of former political leaders, such as Cesar Gaviria, who was president of Colombia, Ernesto Zedillo of Mexico, as well as Alexander Znivanievski of Poland and Ruth Dreyfus of Switzerland. We also have uh, um, um, as members prominent scientists and businessmen like Michel Katskin and Richard Branson. In fact, our basic assumption is that the war on drugs has failed with devastating consequences for individuals and societies around the world. People's lives are, are at stake. In some countries, democracy itself is at risk, driven by a sense of urgency. On June last year, we launched in New York our first report calling for an end to the war on drugs. Our most first recommendation was to stop the stigmatization and criminalization of people who use drugs to do no harm to others. Drug users are not criminals to be persecuted. Drug addiction is to be treated of what it is, a health care issue. Our second recommendation was to encourage the experimentation with models of legal regulation of drugs like marijuana in ways similar to those that regulate the use of tobacco and alcohol. These recommendations are essential to undermine the power of organized crime and safeguard the health and security of people. Our first report generated an incredible amount of media coverage and public debate. Much has happened in the world, for better and for worse, over the last 12 months. In Latin America, the first time ever, presidents of several countries, including Colombia, Guatemala, Uruguay, Costa Rica, Ecuador, are calling for different alternatives to be put on the table. This is a major step forward. In other parts of the world, however, Repressive drug policies continue to violate basic human rights and damage people's health. That is why we have chosen the link, the connection between the criminalization of drug users and the spread of HIV AIDS as a topic, as the topic of our second report that is being launched today. And this discussion is particularly pertinent in advance of the landmark of 12, 12, uh, 212 World AIDS Conference in Washington. We know today, beyond any possible doubt, that measures such as needle exchange, safe injection facilities, and prescription heroin programs do save people's lives. The time to act is now. Then, to distinguish the members of the Commission, Michel Kazatskini and Ruth Dreyfus, to we'll tell you more about the risk we are confronted with and the solutions we are proposing to deal effectively with this global threat. So, if it would be possible, I will ask you, Ilona, to, to give the floor to these two uh, colleagues. Well, thank you.
Thank you very much, President Cardozo. It's great to have you with us, even if it's by phone. So I'd just like to pass immediately the floor to Dr. Michelle Kazatsky. Thank you, uh, Ilona. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me start with a few figures and, and numbers. Injecting drug use accounts for one-third of all new HIV infections occurring worldwide outside Sub-Saharan Africa. Globally, there is an estimated 16 million people who inject illegal drugs, of whom one in five, as an average, is infected with HIV. HIV prevalence, that is, the proportion of people uh, among people who inject drugs being HIV infected, ranges between 10-15%, that's the estimate in China, in the US, to 35% in the Russian Federation, and actually over 35% in a number of countries in the Eastern European and Central Asian region. And whereas the overall growth of the AIDS epidemic, as you may know, seems to have stabilized now with a steady decrease in the number of new infections and a steady decrease in the number of AIDS-related deaths in the last 10 years, there are a few countries and a few regions that do not fit the overall trend. UNAIDS last year said that in seven countries of the world, HIV, the number of HIV new infections increased by 25% in the last 10 years, just the opposite trend. Of these seven countries, five were in the Eastern European and Central Asian region, a region of the world where over 60% of the epidemic occurs through injecting drug use, a region of the world where the war on drugs is actively fought with little or no focus on harm reduction and public health oriented policies. So it is in this context that with the Global Commission, we come today with our first recommendation, which is of the second report, which is that the world, national leaders, and all UN organizations, all UN organizations now acknowledge and address the causal links between the war on drugs, criminalization of drug use, and I would say criminalization of users, as President Cardozo just said, and the spread of HIV AIDS. Clearly, HIV AIDS in people who use drugs and their sexual partners, uh, I believe, continues to be a major public health emergency that the world is just not addressing as it should, despite the evidence that what we call harm reduction strategies are highly effective in preventing HIV infection in people who use drugs and inject drugs. And despite the fact that a number of countries have actually succeeded in achieving remarkable decreases in the last 10 years in the incidence and prevalence of HIV among people who inject drugs. And one of these countries in Switzerland, and we will hear from uh, uh, Ruth Dreyfus in a few minutes uh, about the example of Switzerland. Harm reduction is, is a package of interventions for those of you who who are not familiar or totally familiar with it. It includes needle exchange programs, opioid substitute therapy, information and education, engaging people who use drugs in the decision-making processes, safe injection sites. The evidence that harm reduction is effective in preventing HIV infection is, I believe, comprehensive, compelling, and conclusive. To be implemented, however, as Ruth uh, will discuss in a few minutes, requires a collective, a, a politically and socially accepted shift in policies. And that's what the Global Commission is, is calling for today. And as President Cardozo just said, millions of lives are at stake. I would also like to say that more focus on evidence-based policies and cost-effectiveness of, of our policies may be key at times of economic slowdown when cuts are made to public health and social services. And we know that economic slowdown will actually have a disproportionate impact 
on the most marginalized and stigmatized groups and on the poorest segments of society, including, I would say, an increased risk in the use of problematic drugs and injection. So our message is that prohibition law enforcement has failed in its goals of one, eradicating drug use, and two, protecting people's health. As you will see from the document, trends in use have risen consistently in the last years, 20 years, 40 years. Illegal drugs have become cheaper and more available. HIV AIDS and other health-related risks linked to drug use have increased and prohibition policies have been actually titling the market towards more potent and risky products, often, cu often cuts with, with, cut with contaminants, and also encouraging more high-risk behaviors, including injection in unsupervised and unhygienic uh, environments. Prohibition law enforcement have also led to a true war on users uh, with numerous human rights abuses now reported. People who use drugs, who are arrested or suspected of drug offense are subject to police harassment, police violence, uh, misuse of power, money extortion, and fear of police and stigma actually drive drug users underground away from prevention messages, from prevention services, and away from access to care and medical services. As a physician, I must say that I'm also sorry to report here that stigma and discrimination is also within healthcare settings. Refusal of services, requirements to be drug-free as a condition for treatment, uh, breaches of confidentiality, many examples of that. So as a result, it is estimated that only four in 100 of people who inject drugs and are HIV positive currently access to antiretroviral treatment, as opposed to 40, 45% coverage with antiretroviral treatment now have been reached in low and middle income countries worldwide. Our report also focuses on mass incarceration. As you know, incarceration for minor, minor drug offenses is one of the main reasons behind the increase in prison populations. And at the same time, incarceration is by itself a risk factor for acquiring HIV through syringe sharing, uh, needle sharing, and, and also unprotected sex. In the US, where 2.4 million people are incarcerated in jails and, and, and prisons. It's estimated that 25% of the people living with HIV and over 30% of the people living with a hepatitis C infection have spent some time in correctional facilities. And as the report shows, there is now data to, to support the fact that disproportionate incarceration rates of African Americans, including for drug offenses, of course, is one of the key reasons for the markedly elevated rates of HIV infections in that population. You may know that 50% um, of new infections, HIV infections, in the United States of America are among African Americans. And finally, the report discusses how AIDS, HIV AIDS, has spread because public health approaches to drug policies have often been ignored or certainly not implemented at the scale that would have been needed. The emphasis on, on drug law enforcement, we believe, has created a legal environment to evidence-based HIV prevention measures, such as the provision of clean syringes and, and methadone maintenance therapy. Only eight of, of every 100 drug injectors worldwide currently accesses, accesses uh, opioid substitute therapy. Methadone, as you may know, is illegal in the Russian Federation and limited in access in many countries of, of the regions. 
particularly in, in the region of the former Soviet bloc. And the US Congress has recently reinstated the ban on federal funding of syringe exchange programs, both internally and externally. This after uh, two years of, of um, after lifting a, a, a ban that had existed for over 20 years. So what can we do? Act urgently, we say, in the Commission. Uh, one cannot improve health through a war. That's, I believe, our, our message. If we are to, to stand any chance of reducing HIV transmission among people who use drugs, who inject drugs, by 50% by 2015, which is uh, the commitment of the UN General Assembly last year, 2011, we really need to open up, to step up to the mark and change our ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kazachkin. I would like this to invite uh, Madame Rutrefov to take the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michel. Ladies and gentlemen, the HIV AIDS epidemic is a very harsh, a very cruel and brutal teacher, but it teaches us a lot. He forces us to break overnight long-lasting taboos in order to deal with a new plague with rational measures. Taboos which had brought societies to discriminate and marginalize persons or to repress them with the means of law and the threat of punishment and public infamy. The teacher HIV AIDS obliges us to promote a scientific approach to empower and to collaborate with sex workers, gay organizations, drug addicts, all people who are generally considered as too marginal and too criminal to be recognized as partner in a fight concerning the whole of society. Politicians have to call for the experience of professionals in the medical and social fields who know how to best meet and help those at risk and let them develop new approaches. Politicians have to explain these new measures and to organize and improve their scientific monitoring to make sure that all results will be published, they have to inform the citizens about the benefits, the risk, and the failures of drug policy. In one word, politics has to take the responsibility for a poli policy change, namely concerning the implementation of narcotic laws. Public health has to be at least as important as the repression of drug traffic. The recognition of drug addiction as a disease is not new. What is new is that the addiction of injecting drug users is one of the main sources of the spread of HIV AIDS, Michel told it with clear figures. That not all drug addicts will be able to reach abstinence or at least to reach it in only one attempt in other words, treatments pursuing this aim are not sufficient and they are not adapted to all needs. That substitution therapies, first of all methadone prescription, can direct people away from street drugs, dealers, unsafe environments, reducing the risk of contamination. And that it is possible to implement large-scale program of substitution therapies at low cost and high benefits that still some injecting drug users, the most vulnerable, are not to be rich with the conventional services on, uh, set up. For some of them, the prescription of medical heroin is necessary in order to allow them to comply medical and psychosocial treatment to abandon criminal activities aimed to find the money for the illicit substance and to overcome marginalization but that for a little group of people who aren't able to enter even in one of the large spectrum of therapies, harm reduction measure measures are necessary in order to avoid the spread of HIV AIDS and other severe transmissible disease like hepatitis. Harm reduction measures, and they were uh, 
<coughs> told by, by Michel, safe syringes, distribution of condoms, safe consumption rooms where street drugs can be used under medical surveillance are not only saving the lives of drug users, but protecting the whole population from the spread of an epidemic. That if you are ready to address the issue with such a comprehensive approach, a large spectrum of measures should also be accessible to those in prison. Those who are incarcerated are often at greater risk of HIV transmission, more at risk, and more dependent from the authority under which they have to live. So don't think that they have to take the responsibility if they are in a surrounding where the responsibility is taken from them. Substitution therapies, safe needles, condoms, tests, the guaranteed sustainable antiretroviral <coughs> treatments are absolutely needed in all our prisons. But we have also learned that the use of drugs can also be recreational and not only addictive. Young people are often tempted to experiment dangerous substances, let's just say alcohol, for example. Harm reduction has also to address this group of people who are often less aware about the risk they are taking. Yes. The link between HIV AIDS and injecting drug is complex and covers many, many different settings, biographies, and behaviors. But it can be summarized in two sentences. Lesson number one, a large comprehensive spectrum of services has to be organized and financed on a sustainable basis. Lesson number two, such a public health policy obliges in one way or another, to decriminalize the use of drugs. The emergency of the HIV AIDS threat brought many countries to look for compromises, keeping repressive and punitive law, but changing the way to implement them, responding to the needs of people to be treated and helped, not to be chased by police and forced underground. A mutual understanding of professionals responsible for different aspects of the implementation of the drug policy, police, justice, public health, social integration, had to be constructed. And our experience is that it works. To take an example, in Switzerland, police forces are protecting safe injection rooms from the dealers and from the violence. Or drug addicts collecting used syringes and distributing clean ones cannot be harassed. Or inmates receive the means to protect them and their sexual partners. In my country, Switzerland, this so-called four-pillar policy, including prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and repression, has been broadly accepted by the citizens and the spread of HIV AIDS among and through the drug users is under control. With my fellows from the Global Commission on Drug Policy, I am convinced that the 10 recommendations we present today can save millions of lives. Stopping the contamination among drug users and transmission from them to the wider population allowing people to know about their contamination, treating them, also because we know now that treatment is prevention in this case. All this is necessary to overcome the HIV AIDS pandemic. It can be achieved with a certain level of compromise as shown by the Swiss four pillar policy. This pragmatic compromise was achieved in many European countries and some Australian and Canadian states. It is possible for countries to adopt effective harm reduction measures within existing narcotic laws. But we need to go beyond this compromise. Decriminalization of drug use is a first step. The second step is really to experiment and collect evidence of what type of regulated drug market will dry out the huge incomes of organized crimes and tear drug users from their hands. The war on drugs has failed to reduce the supply and the demand 
and is still fueling the HIV AIDS pandemic. Let us replace prohibition with regulation and avoid jeopardizing public health and security policies with inefficient and costly repressive measures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Dreyfus, for sharing your experience with us. I'd like to invite Maria Yakovleva to share your story with us. Thank you. Uh, dear all, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share my story here. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous and uh, my English is not very good, um, but I can here to tell you my story. Um, my name is Maria Yakovleva. Uh, I, I was born in St. Petersburg and spent most of my life there. Uh, there uh, this, is a, uh, this is the city where I started using drugs. Um, when I was 16, um, I have spent, I have been a drug user for 11 years. Um, 11 years ago, I found out that I have um, uh, HIV and um, um, have a, a hepatitis for 14 years. Um, what is it like to be a drug user in Russia? Uh, it seems that nobody knows wh uh, whether drug use is a crime or it's an illness. Um, when in the late 8th, in the late 9th, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the late 9th, um, a first needle and syringe program opened in St. Petersburg, I started coming there for services. Uh, I was their client. Um, but police uh, uh, were catching people around the site, and I stopped coming there. I was afraid of police, and I asked my friends to go there to change my needles for me. If you are arrested by police in Russia, you don't get a choice between prison and um, or a drug treatment program. Our prisons are overfilled by drug users. The term harm reduction and substitution therapy are particularly illegal in Russia, so it's very hard for me even to speak about them here. For start, there is a need for evidence-based drug addiction treatment for those who need it most. People with advantaged st stages of AIDS uh, to be um, patients and uh, pregnant women and uh, women uh, who just uh, gave birth. At the very least, the government could and should offer this to us. But instead, what's in menu for people who use drugs? The main cause is prison. If you are lucky, you might try the dessert. Uh, government provided detoxication, the only available form of drug treatment. But if you are pregnant, pregnant women are not allowed even detox in Russia. Also, detox programs don't admit women with young, uh, with young children, and often the only option to drop their parental rights. Um, what do you choose, treatment or a child? I have been to the government-provided drug treatment program. It consisted of detoxication, art therapy, and some kind of sports. Um, the duration of it was one month, and I stayed sober for two weeks after passing it. I began to use drugs again. Finally, I found a, a re re rehabilitation program, um, and like any other good um, treatment program, um, it was very expensive for Russia. Uh, these programs are not supported by our government. Harm reduction is outlaw in Russia for ideological re uh, reasons. I don't know the reasons why the government doesn't support good evidence-based programs such as drug addiction treatment program. While I was still dr using drugs, I need to start uh, um, ARV <coughs> therapy for my HIV. I could access the antiretrovirals only by paying a lot of money. HIV treatment was still not available in Russia at the time. It was that period um, when Front AIDS movement fo fought for accessible HIV treatment in Russia. Uh, finally, it happened. 
Eventually, I got through all the burials and I could start ARV, ARV tr treatment um, when I began to stay sober. At that time, my CD4 count was one, uh, 120. Today, there are still no adherence programs uh, for, for drug users. Still today, sober people can pass through these barriers, but um, for drug users, it's hard. I stopped using drugs more than two years ago. Now I am taking ARV, ARVs and I work helping people who are in the same situation as I was. I work in NGO uh, Svecha, it's candle, <laughs> um, that provide low barrier services and um, I'm also a member of EVA, um, an, organ uh, an organization that advocates um, the rights of women who are affected by HIV and other social dis socially significant disease and, and their families. And I'm still fighting for the rights of patients who need access to HIV treatment. Um, to summarize all above, I would ask my government to provide uh, low barrier harm reduction and adherence programs for active drug users, including needle exchange and social supports. To access that uh, drug use is not a criminal issue, but a health one, and to give drug user a choice to go to the treatment program or instead of prison. To ensure access to evidence-based addiction treatment, especially for people who need the most. To be patients, uh, pregnant women, people at the last stage of AIDS. To ensure that programs are available, <laughs> to ensure that programs are avail available, <laughs> available to meet the particular needs of women who use drugs and their children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. You're very brave, so thank you for sharing your story with us. We're gonna hear now Sir Richard Branson, who is with us on the phone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, I, I became a commissioner with the Global Drug Commission uh, because it was a rare opportunity to do real fact-based research into a major policy issue. And along with uh, many distinguished colleagues, used analysis to drive change. I had long thought that the war on drugs did more harm than good, as, for instance, the prohibition of alcohol in the States had done in the 20s. And the Commissioner's research put the data behind those beliefs, resulting in the Commission urging governments worldwide to treat drug use as a health issue and not a criminal issue. While the report released today takes a new look at the problem and finds the facts, for example, the war on drugs has seen a massive increase in opiate use, and heroin users are likely to share needles and transmit HIV. This war is not slowing drug use. It costs billions, and now we see that it also contributes significantly to the AIDS epidemic by driving all users into the shadows. As an entrepreneur, if one of my businesses is failing, year after year for 40 years, I'd close it down or I'd change tax. The war on drugs is perhaps the greatest failure of global policy in the last 40 years. And as the Commission says, refusing to implement such proven public health measures that reduce HIV infection and protect people who have a drug problem is criminal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Richard Branson. Uh, now our panelists uh, have done their first job. Would like to open the floor for questions. <coughs> please, the lady there first, please. So, Caroline Lucas, uh, MP. Thank you. Caroline Lucas, MP at uh, Westminster. Thank you so much for um, a really compelling set of evidence. I think, once again, this is pushing the agenda forward. But I wanted to ask you more about, um, you, you talked a lot about making drug addiction a, a health issue, not a criminal one, and that's absolutely, I agree with that completely. But you said a bit less, really, about the whole um, issue of alternative regulated markets. And I wonder what you could say more 
about that because that's the other side of the coin, I guess, is, is about the, um, the, 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 the crime and, and, and the murder that is associated with the, with the whole kind of drugs markets. And I wonder if there are any alternatives that you can point to already um, where, where we can see some kind of regulated market happening. How do you see the best way of, of countering public opinion when it comes to that? It's for Madame Dreyfus, the question. To, no. to, to Ruth Dreyfus. And okay. perhaps you can ask if no, our president will react, yes. but I will try to give her first, uh, first answers. <coughs> the commission is... Uh, aware that we need more uh, experiment to see what is working really in regulating the market. But there are a lot of first attempts that are interesting. I mean, speaking about substitution therapies and uh, taking the example of heroin substitution, medical heroin, it's a way to regulate also the market because it's a way to consider that it is a substance with a medical use that has to be uh, given in certain settings and, uh, and polyclinics uh, to be uh, put at the disposal of the people who need them. Huh? Uh, but there are other examples. I mean, marijuana or, or cannabis will be, I think, the field where we will see the most new uh, examples of regulating the market. On one side, you know, uh, there is uh, the development of the medical use of, of cannabis product. There is, uh, in some states of the United States of America, the idea of having regulated markets by the states being uh, submitted to, to decision to be taken in the next years. You have the decision of Uruguay to go further in this uh, field. Uruguay, the president of Uruguay, decided, I think, last week that he will uh, create a monopoly on uh, cannabis products in, in his country. Um, I mean, there are this kind of experiment that are necessary to see what is the effect, not on the people, because I think on the people we know that the effect will be to make them less dependent of dealers and organized uh, criminal organization but more to see what will be the effect of the criminal organization. Is it possible really to dry up the market or not? And on this, uh, in, I mean, in this field, we have no evidence, but we have uh, the need to go further in uh, prudent, scientific, monitored uh, experimentation of such, uh, of such models. Um, yes, the, I think your, your question is, is highly relevant uh, and I must say as a member of the Commission I fully agree with what Ruth just said and the need for experimentation but my point, uh, the point I'd like to make here is that um, shifting to more public health approaches and decriminalizing use are steps that yep. do not require major changes and alternatives and, and Ruth just told us that these are steps that can be accommodated even within the current framework of criminal laws in, in, in m most countries and that's what we're calling for as an urgent first step to take. May I, may I perhaps add just one thing? I am absolutely sure that what we call the four pillar model huh? including repression but putting emphasis on uh, prevention and I think prevention is is really uh, the the weak part of the whole of whole p all policies in the in the world treatment and harm reduction can be applied to all kind of addictive uh, behavior alcohol tobacco but also games gamble I think it's a, it's a real name in English and it's always another mix. But we have examples. We have examples in alcohol, protecting use, but allowing broadly in certain countries the use of alcohol in order having some kind of monopoly. We had the same in tobacco, 
we had this monopolies also of the of the state we have the prohibition the ban to have uh, smokers in uh, enclosed rooms so i mean there is always this kind of mixtures between all these measures that are to be put at the basis of the reivindication of regulating these markets. Nobody in the Commission is in favor of just uh, a liber liberalization, I mean, everything being accessible in, in any supermarket for everybody. But we have possibilities really to go further in taking over the control on these markets. Thank you. Any other question? Please. Hi, um, you, you go ahead and then, I'll, oh, sorry, thank no, you. For, for okay, the microphone. Hi, um, I'm uh, Chris Ford, I'm a GP in the UK, and I'm the clinical director of International Doctors for Healthy Drug Policies, which is a relatively new organization which is trying to be a bridge between practice and policy and getting doctors involved in drug policy reform. And I think, um, I'm, I was going to say I enjoyed the presentation, but you know what I mean, that actually I think it's incredibly important, this drug policy. And my question is to uh, Michelle and Maria, in that as a doctor in the UK, I am bound by the Hippocratic Oath to, to use evidence-based medicine. HIV in, 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 in injecting drug users is a completely preventable disease. And yet the figures that you gave, Michelle, were shocking and horrific. What do you see as the best way to, to get HIV to be prevented in people who inject drugs? And how do we encourage the Russian doctors to accept the, the worldwide evidence and change their policy? Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, um, <laughs> Obviously, it's a collective effort, uh, as Ruth has described. Um, it, it requires um, the change of policy will not come from the top. It has to come from the bottom and from an open dialogue. This is the experience in Switzerland. It has also been the experience in Portugal and in a number of European countries when, at the time when, I would say, in the last 20 years, they were somehow more progressive, maybe, uh, with regard to drug policies than they are today. Um, and uh, I'm particularly pleased with you asking this question. And, uh, and I wanted a, a, a short few sentences uh, on, on physicians and, and the medical uh, environment in my introductory remarks, because I, I just don't understand how it can be that some doctors um, violate basic human rights and go against the, the, scientific, the scientific evidence. And as you said, and as everyone, I suppose, should know, um, the evidence that harm reduction is preventing HIV infection in drug users is the most compelling evidence in the field of HIV prevention that we, we have. So um, these are things I do not understand. Um, and, and doctors are part of the society, and, and they have to change. And the, um, but they also follow national rules um, and uh, national programs in Russia, in the Russian Federation, say that methadone and opioid substitute therapy is illegal, as Masha said. So Russian doctors have no choice, uh, but they should speak out, and we should speak out with them, which we're doing today. Um, and maybe the other thing I'd like to say here is we've been talking, I would say, a lot somehow, and with Masha being here, about the Russian Federation. Uh, we're a global commission. We're talking globally here. And I'm just looking here at the list I have of the 25 countries in the world where HIV infections uh, in people who inject drugs represent more than 20% of the total toll of, of, of AIDS. And of course, the Russian Federation and a number of countries of the former Soviet bloc are there. But there's also Canada, 
the, US, uh, the USA, Italy, Iran, Pakistan, Spain, Portugal. So let's not you know, think that it is just one problem somewhere. And uh, we also know that it is an expanding problem in, in Africa, particularly in, in coastal areas. Uh, I would confirm uh, Michelle's words and um, I would add uh, that um, doctors in Russia are chairmen. Uh, do you understand what I say? Okay. Um, if uh, there would be uh, some government standards, uh, they, would, um, they would follow them and uh, I think prevention can be from this part. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman in the back first, then I come to the front. Hi, um, Elliot Alvers, the Executive Director of the International People Who Use Drugs. Can Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> um, Elliot Albers, the Executive Director of the International People Who Use Drugs. Um, I very much welcome the report, as you would expect, I would say. I, I'm very pleased that it's come out, but I just would like to make a couple of comments. I find it deeply regrettable that our issues as injecting drug users are only being raised in the context of HIV mm -hmm. and in terms of us as a public health problem. We must think boldly and move beyond this. And Ruth made some very interesting comments and there's a phrase in um, recommendation two which points to treatment for those who need them. We must insist upon and recognize that some people simply use drugs because they enjoy them. And that, in, that includes heroin, that includes other injectable drugs. Not all of us want to be framed as patients. We certainly don't want to be framed as criminals, but we have to move the debate that one stage further and take it out of an illness-framed paradigm where we're either sick people or we're criminals. That being said, I very much welcome the report. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any comments on that? No, I think it's a very important remark, but... Uh as I told before, the risk the people are taking, also in this recreative uh, way of consumption and a free choice and a controlled and reasonable consumption, they can also uh, be at risk. So they are also to be integrated in a broad uh, harm reduction uh, vision. Uh, that's my first, uh, my first remark, thinking mainly on young people, I wouldn't say they are either ill or criminals, but they are entering in just testing new experiences, broadening their consciousness and so, but taking big risk with that. So I think this is also our responsibility. I don't think that telling that uh, it can just be a free choice to do it without being an illness is sufficient to uh, take the responsibility from the states to make prevention and harm reduction. That's my response to that. So I have perhaps a w vision where the responsibility of the states for public health is broader than just the respect of the and, and the recognition that people can take risk and die from them. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, your remark is important, and I, I know that uh, we, we have really not to put all drug users in a corner of being, uh, of being ill. Now, your second remark was, why does the sec uh, second report of the Global Commission focus on HIV AIDS? Because we decided that this is really an urgency to be brought to the public opinion. And that, uh, as uh, Michel said, as Chris said also, this is really something we can avoid. We can cut this train of the, of the pandemic, and we have to do it. It's really the responsibility of all leaders in the world. Can I clarify, Ruth? My point was not to question the fact that you've concentrated on HIV. It's an absolutely vital issue for our community. My point was a more general one in that when it comes to issues concerning injecting drug users, these issues are always driven by public health concerns. There are other issues involved. That was, that was simply my point. Okay. I, I, and I don't disagree with your first point either. I'm, I'm not in favor of a completely free market where heroin would be available to an eight-year-old. At the moment, that is the situation we have. 
I want to see a regulated market, and I do see the state as having public health responsibilities to provide as safe an environment as possible for people who do choose to use drugs. I'm very lucky in that I've been injecting drug users for 25 years, I don't have HIV, I don't have hepatitis C, and that is because I had access to needle and syringe exchange. I'm very, very lucky, and, I'm, and I would want that to continue to be provided, just to clarify. Thank you. So first, the gentleman here in the front. You, please. The microphone. Thanks. Jeremy, <coughs> Jeremy Seb for the British Medical Journal. Uh, the looking at the kind of the global picture of which countries are favouring a harm reduction and uh, reforming agenda, it seems very much the Latin American and Western European countries are sort of the the factions, if you like, and against, or perhaps including Australia and New Zealand as well. But uh, other than that, it's it's they face nothing but opposition for introducing these sort of more humane and compassionate measures. To what extent or in what way is the Commission engaging with uh, the United Nations and the, the, uh, the three members of the, the permanent members of the Security Council in, in persuading them that um, this is a, a better way forward and um, you know, on a human level and also economically? Concerning the UN system, I think your, your question is a very important one. And we had the opportunity with the first report to, uh, to have uh, a meeting with the General Secretary of the UN. Because we think there is an imbalance in the system, in the UN system, between the different organizations in charge with drug problems, um, with a, a leadership in uh, the fight against crime and drug uh, organized drug uh, organization and uh, in balance in regard with health organization, WHO, uh, UNAIDS, but also UNDP. I mean, the whole problem of the development of countries producing uh, plant drugs uh, and uh, and the human rights, um, the High Commission, Commissioner for, for Human Rights. And we really uh, called for a better balance and for a collaboration between all these uh, organizations. I gave the example on a national level what it needs to bring together people who have different missions to understand each other and to collaborate. And the same effort has to be done inside the UN system. It's not very easy because each of the institution has, an, uh, in a certain sense, another uh, constituency. You have more people representing law and order in Vienna, uh, in, the, in the crime and drug uh, organizations, and you have more medical personnel in Geneva in the WHO. And they often do not speak together at home, and they influence very different policy and contradictory policy in Vienna and in Geneva. So I think it's a responsibility of the General Secretary to bring together these different institutions to collaborate and to bring a better balance. And I think the response was interested. Mm -hmm. I think there is a will also uh, to, to go further uh, I just read a new document on human rights and uh, drug and crime uh, policy coming from Vienna. So things are perhaps moving in this sense. What is important for our commission is to raise the awareness about this imbalance. That's the response for uh, the UN system. And I know that uh, UN AIDS, the Global Fund, uh, WHO, UNDP, the High Commissioner, I think, at the, as a lead in this field, are now trying to take more influence on the global drug policy. Now your question was uh, how to, to address also uh, the countries where uh, we are most uh, preoccupied about uh, their uh, harsh uh, repressive uh, policy. 
this is uh, uh, the program of the global of the global commission for drug policy to have on the meantime uh, <coughs> regional programs and global programs but we are starting in that and i think one of our focus will be europe mainly central and eastern europe to in a, in a way to address directly the Russia uh, Federation and the countries around the Russia Federation, former members of the USSR. So um, we will have the same and way to approach regional programs in Asia, where human rights are really uh, in a difficult uh, situation in relation with drug use, with Africa, Africa being now a hub on the international drug traffic and being touched also by the medical and social problems and corruption, political problems of, uh, of the drug addicts. For Latin America, they were, they were the initiator of all our uh, discussion. And the example I brought uh, about Uruguay and uh, it were mentioned on, uh, on countries like Mexico and Central uh, America show that there is a strong, strong wish in Latin America to change the global policy on, drug po on, on the drugs. It's certainly a better balance, as Ruth just said, uh, you know. Uh, but at one point in time, we need to reform mm. and we need to change the, the conventions. I mean, we're living under conventions, UN conventions, that have been written 50 years ago, before the AIDS epidemic. So given what we discussed today, how is it that we can continue um, to, to be under the rule of a convention that was signed before a, a major in, uh, event in, in global health, uh, clearly linked, as we're saying today, to um, injecting drug use and policies around injecting drug use occurred. So um, having a better balance and having WHO, UNAIDS, and health-oriented agencies uh, being, let's say, co-responsible somehow with UNODC um, would be a good step. But at the end of the day, we, we, we need to revisit the conventions. That, that's what I would say. Um, on the countries, I think Ruth rightly pointed out to the fact that the Commission would like to focus on, on regional uh, issues and certainly again Eastern Europe and Central Asia is a big issue. Africa I mentioned before is an emerging issue and we, we can discuss that more extensively. There's someone in the audience who, who may particularly help on this but I'd like to say that the fact that the country implements harm reduction doesn't, uh, is, isn't sufficient. Uh, harm reduction can actually be extensively implemented with, at the same time, an extremely harsh repressive system. I, I have been in Iran two, two three times. And uh, this is a country where you can actually have death penalty for, for drug offenses. And at the same time, it's an amazing country in the way it implements harm reduction programs. Uh, I was saying earlier to someone in the group that I visited a prison uh, not far from Tehran where 2,000, 2,000 inmates every day receive methadone. This is a huge program just in one prison. It's a prison with 12,000 inmates. But, uh, um, so um, let's let's be let's be careful. It it, it isn't either uh, re repression or harm reduction. It is yeah. a balance uh, that Ruth has been uh, discussing. And 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 the most important <coughs> message I think um, that the Commission is delivering today, and that Ruth has been delivering through the example of Switzerland is that we should be able to change things very rapidly without major, major uh, sort of uh, um, 
changes that, that people fear would be needed uh, and, and fear that the society would not accept. The lady in the front who had a question. Hello, um, Marcelo Gutierrez. Um, I'm from Notimex News Agency in Mexico. I just wanted to see um, where does Latin America stand on these um, health and prevention policies, and particularly Mexico, where is where there is a very problem yeah. problematic situation in terms of uh, drugs and drug related crimes. Misha, do you want to take it? Um, many countries in, in Latin America um, are actually implementing uh, harm reduction um, and um, public health oriented policies um, at the same time. And uh, there are not so many um, countries in Latin America in this list of the 25 countries that I mentioned where um, Actually, I don't think there is any uh, where, where uh, injecting drug use users infected with HIV would represent over more than 20% uh, of the total number of HIV positive people. Um, however, Latin America and Mexico are uh, the living example of how the drug on wars has actually not only failed to decrease uh, the supply, but has also generated an extreme violence. If I, I mean, you would know it better than I do, but it's, I think it's 55,000 deaths um, generated by, by the war on drugs in, in, in Mexico. So um, I would, um, you know, this report is focusing on HIV AIDS uh, and the necessary shift in our view to more public health oriented approaches. Our first report was very much about how the war on drugs has failed, and it has failed. Uh, and again, in 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 one way, it has one of the ways in which it has failed is to generate the violence. So that is why we have been calling on on stopping that war on drugs and and changing the policies and 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 the ideology behind the policies. One small comment on that. Uh, the, the issue on harm reduction in Latin America is that we don't have a lot of uh, uh, inject uh, drug users. So, but we have an uh, immense prohibition on research on other substances that we should develop harm reduction for. For example, crack cocaine. So there are some uh, small, I would say, very small uh, pilot programs on that. But uh, when we talk to the scientific community there, the main problem is the prohibition to do like actual research. So there is a claim to, to just develop uh, you know, uh, evidence to, to be able to treat people that are suffering from other drugs than, in this case, heroin. And we have no substitution therapy for cocaine exactly. at this time. Exactly, yeah. not yet. And uh, I mean, it needs to, to be researched. And, and I mean, I come from Brazil and we simply cannot. I mean, it to, to we talk to the scientists there, there is not a and formal prohibition, but it takes uh, years and years to get uh, permission. So students go and study alcohol instead of studying crack cocaine. And you know, we, we, we do need to, to make these things much easier than, than <coughs> they are. Any other question? There was a gentleman in the back beforehand. Yes? Hi there, it's Johnny Webb from uh, Sundog Pictures. We're in the middle of making a feature documentary entitled Breaking the Taboo, um, which is about ending the war on drugs. My question followed on from Caroline's, really. It was more about um, the, the, the element of re regulation. And it seems to me that every time we get into a debate about ending the war on drugs, there is a kind of fear-fueled hysteria about liberalization and Tesco's and supermarkets selling uh, every drug under the sun, and it stops us having an informed debate about regulation. And I wondered what you felt. H how do we move forward and have a robust and sensible debate around regulation that we can hold and explore what the issues are without it falling into the hysteria of liberalization, which I think stops us um, from breaking the taboo? <laughs> Uh, 
pas sûr d'avoir compris sa question, c'est sur le plan de la, comment, de comment arriver à éviter une discussion voilà, qui soit polarisée. Soit polarisée euh, voilà. ouais. It is clear. It is clear that uh, speaking about uh, regulating the the market is is quite difficult now in in society. I mean, it's uh, it's very polarized. Uh, people see it as uh, a, a, a state that would become a dealer for for all people, uh, addict and so on. But it is, uh, I think, it is possible to to have the same kind of process, but it takes time, that we had also on uh, on harm reduction, and so sensitive uh, issues like uh, consumer rooms, uh, in neighborhoods of the of our cities. I mean, you have just to 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 explain and to change uh, and to and to show the the evidence, uh, and for that you need. Uh, as Michel said also, and uh, that is our experience, to build it from the ground, to build it from the people who are at the front, to build it from the medical personnel, from the social personnel, from the neighbors, from the families of the, of the concerned people, from the concerned people themselves. And you have to have a scientific community mm -hmm. who is really uh, following the whole process and giving uh, uh, an information that is credible. Uh, people can really learn on, on that. The difficulty, I would say, uh, and I have experienced myself because I proposed the regulation of the cannabis uh, market in, uh, in Switzerland and was not followed by one of our <coughs> houses, parliament's houses, uh, is, is really that you can make greater progress in an uh, atmosphere of medical and social emergency than if the people think the problem is more or less under control. And for cannabis, I would say, everybody knows that it is a, the largest consumption of, uh, of illicit drugs in the world, that it is the most uh, important uh, figure you can, you can find in all statistics of the UN ODC, but that it is not, for m most of the people, a real problem. That they live with that, that they try it, that they abandon it, that they do it once a month, or I don't know when. And the difficulty for me, for instance, in proposing a regulation of the cannabis market to the parliament, was that the people said, uh, the parliamentarians said, well, it's not a medical problem, it's not really an emergency, but how can I say to my kids that it is not good if the state is still, uh, is, is still, uh, is not uh, uh, putting a ban on that? I mean, they just wanted the state to reinforce their responsibility as parents. And this, I think, is a misuse of the role of the state. But I think it is, it is possible, and uh, we will see in the United States, in the states of the United States, we will see in Uruguay and, and so on, that it is possible. <coughs> Thank you. Any other question? Um, my name is Anita Krug and I'm the International Coordinator of Youth Rise. We are a, a global youth-led network for harm reduction and drug policy reform. Thank you all for your presentations. It was really interesting and in particular, Ruth, I'm really pleased that you mentioned the issue of young people who use drugs several times um, because it is often a very sensitive topic. Um, but, <coughs> you know, we do know that young people are using drugs, they experiment with drugs um, and those people that are injecting drugs also begin doing so in their youth. Um, a lot of the, the discussion is focused on harm reduction um, and implementation of harm reduction. Uh, but as, as you may know, in many countries, age restrictions do exist on harm reduction services um, in countries where they are implemented. So I was just wondering what the Commission's sort of um, standpoint on that was, and if you support the removal of these age restrictions, and also how to sort of 
you know, begin discussing the issue of young people and drugs. Um, yeah. Do you want to take it, Michelle? Um, I would also like that Masha uh, somehow comments. She said herself that she started her experience um, um, 11 years ago or so. <laughs> so um, I'd, I'd very much like to hear from her how in, in a country that we have been discussing a lot here today, uh, youth positions itself and uh, uh, around drugs. But my comment is first thank you for your question. I think on the commission's side there's just no uh, discussion here. We, we, we see no reason why you know harm reduction measures would not be accessible to young people, uh, although we I don't think we've, we've written any specific sentence on that, but uh, I think I can say it on, on behalf of the Commission. And if you think uh, that we should advocate more on this, then uh, just tell us and, and thank you for, for your comment. Um, I, the other thing I'd like to say, and this refers to the previous conversation, is that um, let's, I think we all wish that uh, cannabis is a sort of first step um, and that experimentation goes there and that um, uh, regulated markets take over uh, the, uh, the current state of affairs. Let's also be careful about not saying this is what we want to achieve mm. and, and stop Just there uh, <laughs> because there is, there is a bit of a danger in the current debate about uh, uh, okay, we'll give you the cannabis and then you can stay quiet, uh, advocates. Um, so I, I just want to warn again that danger. Um, cannabis is, is, is uh, as, as Ruth said, the, the most used. Uh, it is certainly the, uh, the, the, the most accessible drug with which we, 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 in which we could experiment with regulation, but we uh, but what Switzerland and, uh, and the uh, UK, Germany and Holland are doing with the inje safe injection sites of heroin is in fact already a regulation. A, a regulation. Um, so I, I just want, don't want the, 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 the debate, uh, uh, particularly when you know, in front of people who say young people enter the drugs through cannabis and, and then move up somehow. I, I think we should be very careful here. The Global Commission's view is we're talking about harm reduction in general, we're talking about inappropriate drug policies in general. Yeah. Thank you. Maria, do you want to share with us? Um, a little bit, maybe. If uh, I understand your question right, um, there, there is no special services for young, uh, young, young people in Russia. I know that uh, mm -hmm. there is um, special uh, services uh, as prevention, as um, uh, yes, clubs and so on. Uh, uh, pre pre mm, there is some prevention, but um, services for uh, young people who use drugs. Um, I know that um, uh, there is several in all in whole Russia. Um, but uh, they are not supported by our government. It's um, um, world funding money. If I understand your question right. Thank I you. can perhaps just add something. Uh, I forgot uh, among the harm reduction me measures the testing of substance. Mm -hmm. And that is also a very important contribution, I think, and it is linked mainly to party, I mean, it is not now directly linked with HIV, uh, AIDS, and injecting drugs. But I mean, we have also to be present in party scenes uh, where people are in at great risk to, to buy and to receive and to use uh, poisons, very violent poisons, without being uh, really enabled to, to know uh, what they are consuming. So I mean, I think this is also something to be encouraged uh, under the harm reduction measures. Thank you. There is a and lady directly uh, linked to the use. I mean, because mm. uh, Lady Amanda. 
I'm Amanda Fielding from the Beckley Foundation. I, I would like to say what an incredibly wonderful job I think you do in making the world more conscious of the problems and the need for urgent movement. And I quite agree with your remark that um, we need to open up the possibility of changing the UN conventions. And that's why we've commissioned um, a document called the rewriting of the UN conventions, because that's why there's no regulate, uh, there's no experimentation with regulation. And although maybe we can do it with cannabis, the regulation of cannabis won't help countries like um, Central America, Guatemala, where the problem is the transfer of cocaine. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we approach trying to solve? the problems in those countries, which have a very different set of problems to consumer countries, I was wondering. Mm. <clears throat> I think to return to the problem of, of cannabis, that it is just uh, the way to experiment, as uh, Michel said, new ways of regulating the market. And it is possible because there are more. Uh, we have more possibilities to influence on the me on 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 both sides, the production and the consumption in countries where the consumption is high. Uh, I mean, Switzerland uh, was for some years uh, really producing more or less the quantity quantity consumed in the in the in the country, uh, and and in this sense, it is a. Uh, a market that can be overseen. But I think one element I, I discovered in the work of the following and participating in the work of the Global Commission is that cannabis has also a very global dimension. I just read that the production of cannabis in Afghanistan is now higher than uh, uh, that opiate. That uh, the product, the the traffic of cannabis through Mexico, is more or less half of the traffic. So I mean, taking off this part of the market will also allow us to experiment the effect on the organized crime and the international traffic. That is one reason why I think it is really worth to begin with that, but uh, as the first uh, as the first step. So. Mexico and, uh, and uh, Mesoamerica is also touched by the international traffic of cannabis and not only by cocaine. This is to be remarked. Now, uh, as, uh, as Michel told before, I mean, uh, the, the main problem, I think, in Latin America is the problem of violence and the fights between the states and the cartels, but also uh, the corrupting power of the cartels mm -hmm. on the different states. So that's another problem we have touched in our first report, and we think that uh, this has to be looked at in a collaboration between countries where this traffic is aimed to arrive and the producer countries in the way to look how where to act in a way to to reduce the power of the of the criminal uh, organized crime i cannot say more uh, the commission wants really to have evidence before proposing things and in this field we have to find new evidence and it's very difficult to have evidence where regulation is prohibited so it's a kind of circular yeah, problem so we have to try yeah. we have to introduce yeah. elements of regulation uh, we're getting to the end, so take two more questions. So that there are two here in the front. And okay, three more questions. <laughs> then we can start here with the two ladies and then to the back. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Susie McLean. I work at the International HIV AIDS Alliance. We're an organization that works in 40 countries, developing and middle income countries, to get HIV services to communities. And in eight of those 40 countries, we're trying to reach injecting drug users mm -hmm. to get HIV services, the kinds of services that you've described. And of the many difficulties <laughs> that are involved in getting service, 
services to those people. Um, prominent on the list of difficulties are problems with police, problems with corruption and problems with the criminalisation of drug users. The, our target population are in and out of jail all the time. Yeah. Very difficult to provide quality services to those people. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, when we're lucky, we have an opportunity to, it, our partners in many of those countries have an opportunity to influence national debates around HIV. And um, the political problems about drug policy um, reveal themselves to us. So imagine I was the Minister for Health in any number of these countries as diverse as Ukraine or Kenya or Cambodia, or I was the, the head of state in one of those countries, and I said to you, I understand the evidence base, but politically, I will lose support. I will be booted out of office if I, if I advance an effort to change the drug laws. What would you say to me? <laughs> <laughs> The first thing is to break the taboo. I mean, really, to, to, to break the taboo that is on the users, not only from the law and then from the political, uh, uh, from the politician, but, uh, but from the population itself. I mean, it's clear, if you may allow me to use uh, such a word, well, a junkie is not uh, the person you most would like to have at your side when you are campaigning for an election. But you can also show that you are really compassionate to this person and to his family and show that this is also your responsibility. I mean, we had the chance in Switzerland to have organized uh, association of parents of drug users. And we saw their despair in the worst time of uh, our open scenes in, in Switzerland, uh, who were known in all over the world, I think, through TV features. And we saw the misery of the people and the con rate of contamination and the toll in uh, overdoses. So I mean, we had really a constituency who was pushing us to, to act. If you make this constituency visible, you have a chance. Yeah. I would say, well, first, you know, welcome, because um, um, the HIV AIDS Alliance is doing great work in these countries. And I'm familiar with a number of programs uh, particularly Ukraine, India, uh, Kenya. Um, and in Ukraine, just to follow on what Ruth just said, I've attended an, an NGO meeting a few months ago where I met with a, a grouping of families of people um, who use drugs. And, and I believe they are indeed capable of putting the pressure. So what I would say to that politician <coughs> was, but Ruth has more power <laughs> to speak to them, uh, would be open the discussion, mm -hmm. open the debate. And uh, because there are a number of citizens <coughs> that, that also realize that the current situation cannot go on. The, the Mexican uh, colleague has just left, but the Mexicans are fed up with the violence. So I think they're, they're ready, they're mature, for at least opening the debate mm -hmm. and the discussion. They're asking for, for the discussion to be reopened. So uh, what we need is, is to help create uh, the, 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 the frame and the space uh, for that discussion to happen. And that was the first call of, of the Global Commission last year. Uh, we, we are reaching the uh, live stream end, so before taking the two next questions, I would just say that the report is actually available now at the website of the Commission in English and Russian. Other languages are coming, Spanish, French. Uh, it's www.globalcommissionondrugs.org. 
And I would invite uh, Michelle, Ruth, and Maria to say the last words for the, the words for the people that are joining us on video, and then I'll take two more questions at the studio. Okay? Do you do any final remarks? <laughs> <coughs> The call of the Global Commission is a call to the leaders of the world to take really the responsibility to <coughs> look at the reality and to adapt the policy to this reality. I think there is a lot of ideological uh, prejudice in this uh, drug policy. And this was crystallized now for 50 years. Time has come now to see, OK, we have to question what was done, what are the failure of what was done, and to look now the reality of the suffering people and the reality of uh, what uh, the societies are really aimed for, that security, and this policy didn't bring security, that's uh, health, and this policy didn't bring the health. Okay, Michelle. I would say the, the I really enjoyed the discussion this morning, and we've been covering not only this year's report, but somehow last year's report, and that is very important. But to come back to this year's report, the HIV AIDS epidemic continues to grow uh, among people who inject drugs. And the uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asian region is the region of the world where the AIDS epidemic continues to grow, whereas globally, the epidemic has stabilized and is actually decreasing. And we know what it is that we can do um, by implementing harm reduction on large scale, by shifting the, p the policies. So let's do it. Otherwise, we, we are sort of uh, passive uh, observers of, 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 of suffering and of, of death that, that we know can be avoided. So this is why I really joined this very urgent call of the Commission today. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. I'm really glad uh, that um, I have such an opportunity to, um, to join you in th this discussion. And um, it's very good uh, that um, uh, a global commission and um, you are from Global Commission. I'm from um, from uh, grassroots. <laughs> uh, yeah, from grassroots, and mm. uh, that's good that uh, we uh, feel very um, very uh, close. Um, um, the um, no, решение uh, вопросов. Uh, yeah, that we uh, feel very close deci decision taking. And um, I'm really happy that I could uh, change a little bit by my, <laughs> by my story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for <coughs> joining us today on video. So we'll continue here in the studio. So thank you, Maria, Ruth, and Michelle. Thank you. So thank I think you. we can take uh, two more questions. Yeah, five minutes.